to get started. It is um, 6.30 on the dot, and um, I want to get our program rolling. Please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Patty Smolin. I am a business liaison librarian with the Schomburg Township District Library, and tonight we are welcoming back Rebecca Hoffman with Good Aid Concepts, and Rebecca has brought uh, programs to our library and other libraries in the area on Facebook marketing. And tonight we are talking about small business marketing and concepts and she will get started in just a moment. I wanted to make mention, we're doing tonight a little differently um, because we have a close knit group. If you would like to make this more of a dialogue and as Rebecca gets started in, in talking and in facilitate, facilitating questions, um, you are permitted to um, unmute yourselves and, and engage a little bit more. Um, if you would rather, you can submit questions or comments in either the Q&A or chat, and I will be fielding those comments and questions here, as well as on YouTube. And so tonight's session will also be recorded. Um, it's presently being broadcast on YouTube, and we'll have some attendees coming in that way as well. So um, I'm going to also include my name and my email address in the chat in case you have any questions that are directed more towards the library that either I can answer for you or one of my colleagues can help with, you are most welcome to get in touch with me um, or any of my reference coworkers. Um, trying to see if we have anything else. I, I believe all of you that have registered, I had sent out a handout earlier today. It was a four page handout that Rebecca had um, thoughtfully provided to us beforehand. If for any reason you did not receive that, please get in touch with me and I'll make sure that you do have it because we will be reviewing that tonight. So Rebecca, without further ado, I wanna say thank you so much for coming back to us. We would, I know we welcomed you to our central location and our Hoffman Estates branch location. And tonight we're welcoming you to our virtual location for the time being. Thank you for accepting the invitation. Well, thank you, Patty. And I'm so glad to come back to Schomburg Library. Um, we were reminiscing before this began. Uh, I think I was in, on site with you twice last year and it feels like moments ago and yet how much the world has changed. And so that's one of the things that we're talking about today, which is really how to market a small business during a pandemic and then beyond. And so we've got a lot of insights now about eight, nine months into this whole episode in our life. And uh, I think uh, for the purpose of this conversation, it'll be helpful if you have questions, you can just ask them as I'm going, stop me if you'd like. Uh, and if you prefer, you can also type them into chat and we'll try to watch for those uh, and read them out loud as they come in. I should now uh, share my screen with you and we can begin. Great. So we call this open for business because we're open for business. It would be helpful to hear if anybody wants to unmute and say, what sort of business are you conducting right now? Are you a landscaper, a house painter, a greeting card maker? If anyone wants to comment right now, that would help us because we can think a little bit with you about your business. You can type it into chat if you want, if there's any thoughts. And if not, you can comment later. Uh, and I'll begin. So this year is very interesting in that we began the year in a typical sort of way with all the hopes of a year in January starting our businesses and it shifted very quickly to something we just didn't know what to do about. Uh, back in March, for a moment, it seemed as though time had stopped. And in my practice for about two weeks, it got very quiet, which is very typical in a marketing situation. When things are not going well in the world, marketing is not the first priority. But then people realized that business was going to continue, at least in the businesses that could continue. 
And all of a sudden, everybody kind of looked around and said, hmm, what do we need to work on? What sort of marketing can we do if everything is shutting down? And the number one thing that everybody needed to work on, which we knew we needed to do before all of this, but it wasn't such a priority, is what I call reputation management. And as my document says, it's the name of the game right now. And the truth of the matter is, it was always important to work on the reputation of your practice, your business, your enterprise, uh, but now more than ever. Um, with people sheltering in their homes, suddenly all due diligence, all the research that people would do for anything was moved online. So every smart business owner now is developing a strong online presence. And by that, what we mean is um, not just a website, but a social media strategy. Um, if there are third party platforms on which you should be listed, for example, Angie's List, Yelp, Avo, um, any kind of uh, directories that pertain to your profession, now is the time to make sure that the information about you and your business is correct, that it's engaging, that it's attractive. And then you need to do something called an audit of the digital footprint. What does that mean? It sounds pretty technical, but it's not. When you audit your digital footprint, you literally Google yourself or use any search platform you prefer, DuckDuckGo, Bing, it doesn't matter. Um, search for yourself in quotes, I think uh, those are called Boolean operators, if I'm not mistaken, Patty. Um, and see what turns up. What's on page one of the search results? What's on page two? Are you satisfied with what you see? Sometimes you'll say, yes, I am. And sometimes you'll say, gosh, this doesn't seem quite right. And then you have to work toward building the page one, page two, page three search results, because that's what consumers can see. And when consumers are doing their due diligence, you want to make sure that the reputation they're reading is really reflective of the good business you're running. Uh, it's really important. Uh, and if you need help with things like this, I should also note after this presentation, you can always reach back to me, send me an email, um, and we can find a time to chat by phone if you have more particular questions after this session. The second thing to consider is how to be social. Uh, so people probably range between novice and expert on social media. And I will tell you in my work with clients who work in all different industries and professions, many people will say to me, I don't really like XYZ platform. Therefore, I shall not put my business on it. For example, people will say, uh, I don't really like using Facebook. So I don't really want a Facebook page for my business. And to a certain extent, that's okay. But to some extent, it's not because you have to kind of reverse the thinking on this and realize that your customers are on Facebook, even if you're not. And you need a Facebook page to communicate a lot of information in a, in a simple and casual way and reach people who would care about your product or service. Um, I've said this in prior presentations and I'd say it tonight too. You should think about a Facebook page, a LinkedIn page, an Instagram page as a storefront, but a virtual one. And you would never want to have a storefront where the windows are smudged and the flower boxes have dead flowers in them and there's papers blowing in the alcove where the front door is. You want it to look fresh and tidy and appealing. And the same is true for your social media um, uh, pages for your business. It's really important to make sure if you're on Facebook that you have a custom URL so that you become facebook.com uh, and then your business name. Mine is Good Egg Concept. So you can just find me very easily without a lot of coding gobbledygook after facebook.com. You want to also make sure that you respond quickly to any comments that come in to content that you're publishing. When people comment, it could be anything from, I love your cookies or your cupcakes to, what time do you open to, do you have this kind of pair of shoes that I'm looking for? Or I called earlier and whoever I spoke to wasn't helpful. You may get all kinds of comments. You wanna to reply to those as quickly as possible for the, the real purpose of demonstrating that real human beings are running this business and that feels good to consumers. And you get rewarded on Facebook especially and other channels too for quick response time. So if you get a comment, uh, and you reply to it as the page quickly, let's say under an hour, 
and you do this with some frequency, Facebook rates you and will say on your profile, this page tends to reply within an hour. So consumers know that this is a true and real business that people are conducting. And if you write to it, you're going to get the assistance that you need. This is really important on a social channel. Um, you also want to make sure that you test approaches. So of course, you'll populate your page with all the essential information, but then you're going to be publishing content, sharing articles, sharing expertise, um, offering products or services on sale, um, opportunities to win a prize, you name it. You have to kind of test and see what resonates with your audience as it grows. What does your audience respond to for your business? And what does your business sound like? That's really important. When you're communicating in the world through your social media channels, it has a sound. It has what I call a narrative voice. And you want to make sure that that voice is one that's in alignment with what you want for your business. Are you professorial? Are you cheeky? Are you serious? Are you playful on Fridays and the rest of the week all business? There's lots of approaches that you can take and you can communicate it through the content that you publish and the tone that you set. Um, the third thought on doing marketing during this time is that video is real interesting. Um, we should ask Patty if she can comment Does the library still loan out um, cameras and equipment for use? Um, that would be helpful to know. We do still have, a, it's called a video of things. And that's kind of a terminology in, in most libraries. And yes, we do still have um, those items that are available for checkout. While the library's building is not open right now, you can certainly put those items on hold and we would make them available through the drive up for, for individuals. Fantastic. So um, for patrons of the library, this is valuable. Thank you, Patty. This is important because you're, you wanna use good equipment to get video. And I would recommend if it's possible to have somebody assist you who is either a professional or somebody who I would just put in sort of air quotes, who gets it, who knows how to produce video. Video should probably never be longer than two minutes unless you have some special presentation because consumers will watch probably 60 to 120 seconds and then they start to fade. But if you provide video that answers questions people might ask about your service or your, or your products or your business uh, and you place those on your website or you publish them on your social media channels or you embed them in emails that you're marketing to people, you're gonna reach a different type of person. The person that watches something is different than the person who reads something and is different than the person who listens to something. So in the marketing game, and you think about percents of um, reaction, if you can get a few percent of the people to do one thing and another block of percent of people to do another thing, and yet another block of people to do a percent of another thing, you're gonna be more successful over the long haul. So video is important, but I always ask people to use caution with the notion of live, Facebook live, um, YouTube live. It's okay to do if you know what you're doing, but if you haven't learned how to use it, you may run into some challenges that could be very problematic. One of the most important things to consider is you wanna create what we would call an authentic experience of who you are and what your business represents. However, that doesn't mean it shouldn't be produced a little bit. Um, you wanna think about kind of the atmosphere that you're in, what does it feel like? What does it look like? Does it sound right? And when you're producing video, you wanna give some consideration to those things, plus how you appear or whoever you're designating on the video. Uh, I think this is a great year for video because Google rewards businesses that have video. When someone searches for a business, uh, it could be anything from a pizzeria to a law practice to an accounting practice. It doesn't matter what. If you have videos associated with your business, the video clips are brought higher in search than most websites. So you'll see like position one and two or three search results, which are website links. And below that will be video links. So if you have a few videos that are answering questions about your house painting service or your floral display service, those are gonna appear higher than most of the website links. So you'll wanna pay attention to that as you go, particularly if you're in any kind of industry where there's a lot of questions being asked that you might like to answer to help bring people closer to your practice or your business. Uh, number four, this one is not sexy, but it's really important, which is competing in Google search. 
Google search is a vast universe of um, tools and tactics that you need to kind of, and they're levers that you need to pull to help your business succeed. So one of the first steps to take is to make sure your Google profile is correct. Assuming you have a brick and mortar address, let's use an example of a pizzeria. If you own a pizzeria and um, it is, uh, it, let's say it has one or two office locations, you have business addresses. Now, if, if the information is correct and you're labeled as a pizzeria or a thin crust pizzeria or whatever term you're using for Google to know who you are, you can also receive reviews. And when you have uh, reviews, your your profile will be higher natively in search than the business that doesn't have reviews. Or if a business has 20 reviews and you have two reviews, the business that has 20 reviews will, generally speaking, on the whole and in the main, appear higher in search results. And Google doesn't discriminate. So if you have so-so reviews and great reviews all mixed together, uh, you're still going to float higher than the business that has two or three reviews. So what you want to do is start to do something called Google optimization. You want to make sure that your website is talking to Google and feeding it uh, information that you have the keywords that people are searching for embedded in your website, both on the front end, what people can read, and the back end on the addressing, the meta tagging, and the keywords that are woven into the backside of your website. You want to make sure if it's not easy for you to do, which it isn't for a lot of people, that you work with a skilled specialist to ensure the website is making good use of keywords on both the front end and the back end. And that makes you as competitive as possible. I work with a few different services that do good work in this space. And if you need any suggestions after this event, uh, I can always suggest to you. We won't do it right now, but it's something you should know um, that Google search one of the challenges about it is it's not as easy to see as if you make a brochure or a pretty promotional item. However, when you invest in your Google uh, metrics for your website and your business, you're really investing in the visibility of your business, um, which is so important for, um, for businesses that are in very competitive channels. The next thing to think about is what we call content marketing. Content marketing is increasing in value everywhere. And this is really storytelling. Um, it's not just the telling of the stories, but it's giving people a reason to care about your business. Uh, when you have affinity uh, qualities to your business, you wanna mention them, whether it's certain brands that you represent, schools that you've attended, um, community organizations with which you're involved, uh, this is very assuring to people and they feel connected when they can say, oh, I care about that too. And storytelling is interesting. I use an example because it's kind of an extreme one, but it's one that people can understand very easily. If I ask you about Apple and I ask you, what do you think Steve Jobs was like? Most people can say what they think he was like. Now, they may be right, they may be wrong. But what they're usually retelling is pieces of what they call the origin story of the company. There was the garage, there was the dropping out of college, maybe he wasn't the nicest guy in the world to his family, maybe he was. He had big ideas about computers, um, he was undaunted, and we could go on and on as if we just had lunch with him um, because they've done a great job of communicating the story of the business. And so I would encourage everybody tonight and going forward to think about what is the story of your business? Um, some people place all of this on what we call the about page. Uh, and that's a great place to write uh, the story of your business. Did it begin as a lark? Was it something you were just doing to help in the community and it turned into a business? Was it a need or a service that you believed um, was necessary and helpful in your community? And did you create something to help uh, a population of people? Tell the story. What schools did you attend? Why does it matter? What organizations are you connected to? And so on. Uh, and you can post this um, content, not just your about statement, but any kind of storytelling on your social channels, in your blogs. If you want to, you can go on LinkedIn and instead of writing a little content post about what's on your mind, you can publish an entire article right off the top of LinkedIn. They make it very easy. And that is very um helpful if you're trying to create 
what we call an authentic kind of point of view of your business so that it doesn't seem mechanical or uninteresting or unimportant. The more that you can add personality to your organization, the more likely it is to resonate with people and help it succeed. Number six, this is an interesting one. I always say print is not dead. And by that, I mean, yes, this has been the most digital year of our lives. We're doing this conversation by Zoom when normally we'd be together in a room and we would have a different kind of feeling, but we want to create that kind of feeling here too. We want you to feel like you can ask a question. We want you to ask a question if you have a thought about something that you want to share. Um, but besides all the digital, there's print. And print takes many forms. Uh, for example, when you go to your mailbox and you get your mail, maybe some of it's not that interesting to you, but is there ever something that you find interesting that you set aside? And what is that? Is it a magazine, a newsletter, a proper letter from another business, a postcard that's well-designed? Pay attention to those things. Because people are home right now, um, it's, it's very possible uh, to mail things to people in print and get a big reaction. You could mail to your present audience. You could do a zip code mailing through the postal service that's extremely affordable. It's called the Every Door Campaign. Those are terrific and very low cost and an excellent way to reach people in a specific community. You could also think about writing a letter. You could think about creating a newsletter. People are reading right now. Um, the other place where print is very interesting is in advertising. The local newspapers have never been more read. They're seeing something like five to 10 times readership, both on their online and in their subscriptions. Um, it might be surprising to you to hear that, but people are reading. They're reading the magazines that float into the mailbox in various communities and community newsletters. They're reading the um, pastoral newsletters from houses of worship uh, and everything in between. So. I would encourage you to consider what I refer to as a more analog approach to marketing this year as you head into the new year and not be afraid of some of like the essential collateral, the brochures, the postcards and so forth. Um, because everything is so digital, you will get audience for paper uh, printed items and that can feel very good. And as I mentioned earlier, there's the people who listen to things, the people who watch things, the people who read things, and there's the people for whom uh, a tangible item is uh, like a totem that helps them feel connected to something. They put it aside and they say, I need to call this organization to ask them to help me with my business or I want to purchase something from them or whatever it is. Um, and related to that, we need to think about communication design to make your print sing. I have too many clients that come to me and they'll say things like, I was designing my own brochure and then I found I really didn't know how to put it together, which is very true. It is hard to put things together um, in the same way that some people will enjoy changing the oil in their car. Most people will not. And in the same way that some people might enjoy making their own brochures and logos and business cards, most people will not. So it's really good to have a designer identified, someone who can work with you and help you develop what we call a visual language for your business or your product or your service. When you have this, it is clear as a bell and very appealing and very flexible that you can use for all purposes, whether you're doing advertising, um, making marketing materials, or just building a template for a newsletter. When you have good design, things really make sense. Uh, and good design, I always say, good design should always aim for tension and not anxiety. And what that means is you wanna create visual tension between you and the recipient of what you're issuing, whether it's electronic or in print. You also wanna use that tension to bring people closer with an affinity for your product or service or business. And lastly, you wanna avoid anxiety, which is something that's hard to read, something that maybe is confusing or that has mixed priorities where you're not exactly sure what the intended purpose of the communication is. So always aim for tension and not anxiety with your good design. And if you ever need help thinking about designers, I know a lot of independent ones that like to work on a project basis. You could always email me and I could share some names with you. Something related to this, these are all related, is carving out the authentic voice. What does your business sound like? We spoke about this before. 
with respect to social media, but in total, what does your business sound like? Do you have a tagline? Do you have a value statement or a proposition that you want people to know about? Uh, you want to make sure that that's well produced and people can read it and see it and understand it. Um, this is really important. The consumer on the street has a very difficult time telling one attorney from another when they're looking for service. They really can't tell who's the right one for me. I received a few names from someone I respect, but I can't tell the difference from lawyer A, B, or C, or house painter A, B, or C, or florist A, B, or C. I can't tell. But if you have an authentic voice and a clear speaking website and a good social channel uh, that's communicating clearly, the consumer is going to figure out where they fit and they're going to enjoy being your customer or your client. Um, and to that point, do not be afraid to issue marketing emails. I joke and call it emails, the cockroach of the internet. Well, it is, it's not going anywhere. It's here. We still get them and people find them mildly annoying. And when people don't want to be part of something, let them unsubscribe. Always make sure you use a platform that permits subscription and unsubscription very easily with a keystroke. But the most important thing is make sure any email that you issue for your business is clear, well-designed, appealing, um, thought-provoking, informative, has a good subject line, and so on and so on. Uh, don't be afraid to use it. If you have a contact list, you can uh, reach people very affordably, I don't have to tell you, and possibly convert them to clients or prospects. I do have a question for Patty with respect to email. Patty, does the library, is the library able to generate um, marketing mailing lists as it used to or um, change of address lists if people want to reach certain groups? The subscriptions that we have to uh, a, a select number of databases do not have emails available. It, it is for mailing purposes only, not email. That is considered more proprietary and okay. that would be... Um, additional, um, I'm sorry, a variation of the, of the version that is available to public libraries. So the answer is no, because the, the versions of Reference USA and Hoover's that we get or Mergent um, are absent of email. Okay. That's helpful, uh, but you can make it's mailing marketed lists. more. It's marketed more toward, yes, you can make a mailing list. Okay. And I know that I work with, uh, I work with patrons on that frequently. Um, I, I, the versions that you're talking about with email available are they're a high, much higher cost, mm -hmm. and I think that they are marketed more towards uh, corporate information centers. Got it. Okay, like that's helpful public, to know. Yeah, that's really what in, in um. So okay, in so a corporate our setting, a knowledge today, librarian would be in there. Would be that's there so there. helpful because our attendees today should be working to generate an email list that makes sense for their business or practice but they could come to you to also generate some kind of mailing list they could use with the postal service um, by zip code, by, by char demographic characteristics they might be seeking in the area. Exactly, and I think if they are intending to go and, and build it based on you know, email, that starting it off with what we have um, for a structure would be advisable. Okay, that's great. Um, and see, again, this is a resource that the library has even during a pandemic where it seems like maybe you can't get access to the things that you might need. With a careful phone call and some planning, you'll be able to get what you need to support your business development. And these are wonderful resources that libraries have that you should make use of, especially at this time. Um, as we think a little bit about businesses and what we can do, we should also think about to ask our customers to become evangelists. And what that means is, ask them to write a review of you. Ask them to go onto Google and make a review. Ask them to go onto Yelp and make a review. Ask them to go onto any platform where you're represented, where there could be a review and let them say something wonderful about you. Um, if you have a lot of clients, it may make sense to engage in um, purchasing a review platform service, which is not necessarily expensive, but valuable if you have tens or dozens or hundreds of customers, it may make sense because you're going to want to generate, these reviews are worth gold. And when, you're, when your clients and customers are talking about you, um, this is the best. This is where when they share on other Facebook pages, go to so-and-so, they do the best house painting, go to so-and-so, they make the best cupcakes or whatever it is. 
you, you can't pay for that kind of marketing. So if you can help create a feeling of evangelism among your clients and customers, you're going to benefit over the long haul. Um, asking for reviews, uh, and resharing their testimonials. You can create them as memes on Canva, which is totally free, uh, and republish those on your social channels. Uh, this would be fantastic for your business. And related to that is word of mouth. Word of mouth is uh, something that some businesses have an easier time with than others. For example, a pizzeria. If a pizzeria has delicious food, people talk about it. They say, don't you just love the food from XYZ Pizzeria? Or if a plumber rescues you from a terribly flooded house and fixes whatever went wrong, you're going to tell your friends about it. And the word of mouth really travels and people come back and they say, I remember you mentioned something about some great cupcakes or pizza. Could you tell me who that was who made that? This word of mouth, just like asking for evangelist uh, reviews, you can't pay money for it. It's the best. So if you can find ways to create uh, word of mouth, you're going to be very successful um, in your marketing endeavors. And something that's important, um, but it's not, it's not easy to see, is the SEO work. We talked a little bit about it before. It's not something most people can do by themselves. So it's important if you're going to do SEO work to find the right organization or person to help you ensure that your website is fully optimized and performing at its best um, for, for your marketing purposes. Um, I know of some organizations that do SEO work and it's affordable. So it's not a terrible expense. There's no big contracts and you can uh, beef up the backside of your website to make sure it's performing. Because one thing my clients are continually surprised by is when their website is analyzed um, and we look for maybe the top five, top 10 websites uh, a given website is competing against. More times than not, the websites that they're competing against are not in alignment with their business. They may use some keywords that are similar, but they're often not geographically in the same place. They're often not doing the same line of work, but it sounds similar to Google. Uh, so it's really important to, when you're doing your SEO work, to make sure that you're considering your keywords, your meta tags, that every photograph that you publish on your website is tagged and addressed that any kind of search terms that people might be using to get to your website are knit into it. And that's something that good SEO can help you with and really important these days in a pandemic year and after the pandemic year, uh, you'll be more successful. There is a lot of, um, I call it real estate, but there's a lot of land you can claim under your feet if you do some of these tactics that will improve your business and help you perform even against businesses that are more established and have been around for a long time because a lot of organizations are not doing this work. So if you do endeavor to do this work for your business, you're gonna win, you're gonna be successful and that's gonna feel really good. Um, lastly, I wanna share with you a thought um, that thought leadership is really important. Think of yourself, you're an expert. You know your business better than anybody, but who does know about that? Um, if you can blog about it, that's good. If you can publish something on LinkedIn regularly, that's good too. If you can pitch the media and ask them to cover any particular story that you frame, that's even better. I had a lot of success this year in pitching our local media for clients around a lot of different topics. And basically what happened was when the pandemic started and everything was kind of like tipped like a, an apple cart on its side, we saw things differently. We saw the stories. The stories were unique and different. And when I got in touch with my media contacts, they wanted the stories. They wanted to tell the stories. Um, I can give you an example. Uh, I work for many professional law practices and some of them are family law practices that work in the divorce space. And one of the things that happened at the beginning of the pandemic is uh, people were sheltering in place, and there was a perceived sense that the courts were simply closed. And therefore, if you needed to do anything legal in nature, you were stuck. But in fact, if you were willing to choose certain types of divorce, you could get through it pretty easily. I wouldn't say easily, but you could get through the process um, sometimes quicker than in a conventional time because all the proceedings were via a conference call and Zoom. And 
people didn't know this. So the press picked this up and talked a lot about it. And they talked a lot about pandemic divorces. The press also talked a lot about other kinds of businesses and services that suddenly had to shift how they were offering what they do. And these were stories that needed to be told. And now eight, nine months into this whole situation, there's more stories yet as we face a new year coming, as we look at consumers trying to make decisions about this, that, or the other thing. I would encourage you to think tonight and beyond what stories can be told about the work that you do. Could be very interesting if you're a house painter. Is everyone painting their houses now? I don't know. Um, what stories can we tell? And to whom can we pitch them? And let's get some coverage because when your thought leadership is uh, produced and, and published or broadcast, you get to share that and it exists forever. And it's a wonderful thing for your business and for you as a professional. So um, I think this is enough for tonight and we should open the floor for questions if there are any, uh, or if we wanna talk about any particular area more, I'd be glad to do that. I should note, the document that Patty shared with you also includes um, a tip sheet for content. I share this with all of my clients whenever I do a presentation because people often ask me, what should we say? The hardest part about social media is knowing what to say every day. And I always say, try to schedule things and try to think about different ways of publishing different kinds of content that showcase your expertise your product quality, any sales that you're having, the team that you work with, the space that you work in, the view from your office window could be very interesting. So this list here is intended to offer you ways to think about how you might communicate with people on your social channels and maybe through your email marketing as well and possibly your website. These are meant to be very general. They won't apply perfectly to every business, but you get the idea. And you can use this to think about what you want to say to people um, and how you want to show your interaction with other organizations and how you want to inspire people and so on and so forth. And lastly, the last page is just a planning sheet. Uh, as we get closer to January, we really have a fabulous opportunity to think about the year ahead of us in terms of the four quarters it represents. And you could literally jot tonight, tomorrow, when you're having lunch over the weekend, what would you like to achieve per quarter for your business in the marketing, communications, and brand space? And the good news is because it's your business, you can always adjust the plans as you go, but it's a lot harder to achieve things if you don't have a plan. So you can use this worksheet to begin to think about what you could do between January and March that would be good for business, and then, and then the next quarter, and the next, and the next. And I want to just leave you with that because I think it's helpful to, to have a worksheet. Um, when we put pen to paper, it's very different than when we're on a screen. Uh, our brains work differently. And all the research shows that when you write things down, maybe as a promise to yourself or maybe as just a, a challenge, you may achieve much more than you even expected. And that would be wonderful and good for your business. Um, so I think at this point, Patty, we should probably open the floor for any questions, if any have come. And if not, are there any particular areas we should cover more? Okay, well, we have one question that is directed towards me, which I'm just going to handle right now. And it is an individual that did not receive the handout. So I'm taking care of that sure. as we speak. And Terrific. I'm also going to invite, um, we do have some of the comments back from your initial question, which was what were um, the positions and in industries that individuals oh, good. Had, had worked in. So um, I'm just gonna go back and do a quick recap on that. Um, one of our attendees is a commercial printer. Another mm -hmm. is a financial advisor. One is a vocal coach. One is a travel advisor. I'm trying to Great. scroll down. Um, we did have a comment when you were talking about, and I, I certainly appreciate this, that print is not dead. Right. And we have one individual that commented and said, definitely not dead. Um, this person who has customers that um, they do uh, print at a, at a per piece mm -hmm. dollar amount. And so would that attendee like to unmute and, um, and chime in a little bit? There were some comments that yeah. she had that were really um, applicable when it came to mail lists. I know that uh, Rebecca, you had asked me about mail lists and I was mentioning that while the library does have some fine e-sources that the email addresses are not available. But is right. that attendee still on, Danielle?
Danielle, are you with us? Okay. She is having a, a, some tech issues right here. Um, well, we can, we can talk for a moment about print if you want to. Um, printers that I know definitely slowed down this year because people didn't realize that this is a good time to prepare everything because we're not always gonna be in the state that we're in right now. And people are still going to need brochures, menus, they're still going to need newsletters, they're going to need signage, car magnets for the side of their cars and their vans. This is a great time if you haven't done it to do it and if you have done it to refresh it. Um, and I think you know our local printers have been major partners to the marketing community for a century or more. And just because this year has been sort of like a, an apple cart tipped on its side or a sock turned inside out, um, I don't think we should forget about the terrific resources that are just right here in our midst. And it might even make sense to pay a visit to your local printer and talk about what you should be working on for your particular business. Because um, often printers know a lot about the marketing business um, in an interesting way. We can talk a little bit too, if you want, about the different types of professions that people mentioned. I heard travel agent, vocal coach, financial advisor. Um, each of you are experts. And I would be interested to hear if you'd be willing to share what challenges you face this year uh, or not. I mean, some businesses are thriving. Some businesses are definitely suffering, particularly ones that involve close interaction with people. I'd be interested to hear, or how did you pivot? How did you turn things around so that you could be successful? If people wanna share that, it would be terrific to hear it. I don't know if it shows in the comments, if Patty can um, see anything. I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm reading through. Um, yeah. The one patron that um, unfortunately is having some audio issues uh -huh. um, mentioned that, so this is a, a commercial printer who also does signage and she, she helps with clients with a lot of what you've described tonight, Rebecca, mm -hmm. um, and especially are able to help people enter into the territory of graphics in a, in a painless way. Oh, I like when somebody describes it, something is painless. That's, that's an effective word. Yeah. And she says, one of the things we have in offering clients while we slow down are some free graphic work. Oh, that's nice. And I think um, now is a good time. I didn't have it in my information, but now is a good time if you do get a designer or maybe the local printer can help you to put together something that I call brand identity standards. This would be uh, a document that portrays your logo, however, which way it could be shown in reverse color, full color, black and white, and so forth. The typefaces that are your official typefaces that appear on your website and any design documentation that you have. This is really important. And the color palette. What colors represent your business? And nobody is better to help you with this than a printer. These we call your Pantones, your, your CMYKs. Uh, you want to make sure that if you have a signature color for your business that you know what that is. Because when you do go to print or build something on a website, you want to make sure that everything is consistent across all the products, all the publications, all of the materials. And a printer can always help you with that. Um, and that's, that's huge. When you control for that, it's sort of like Coca-Cola red. You know it when you see it. And their cans are not pink uh, and they're not orange unless that's intentional and they're making a different product. And so you wanna make sure that you have your official information, your colors, your typefaces and your logo and any presentations on one document called a brand identity standards. It's interesting you say that, Rebecca, because, you know, you say Coca-Cola red and I think Target red. Mm -hmm. Red is red, except they are not the same. They're all you know? different and they, they can be similar. But, you know, when you add shape and form to the color, you know what it is. You if you just saw the typeface of Coca-Cola, but it was just an alphabet, you'd still know that's the Coke typeface. And if you and see that would Target, invoke a thirst, you right. know, one, yeah. one color evokes one response and another color just makes me want to go shopping. So absolutely. And color is very powerful in terms of persuading people to do one thing or another. We uh, react to the McDonald's uh, red and yellow. We react to the UPS. We react to all these colors and have full kind of emotional responses to them, which is why they're used so intensively. But you can do that too in small business. 
We have a couple comments too, and I'm going to read them in, in just a sure. moment. I did just want to make one commentary for myself, which is that I appreciate the, the strategy that you've laid out in your handout um, for the purpose of social media for a, a business and, and professional purposes, very, very different than for personal context and planning a strategy of what to post and um, kind of staying focused on that so that you avoid that knee jerk reaction of responses or just regurgitating mm -hmm. old posts just mm -hmm. to have a post, just to yep. be active. And you just right. don't want to fill up white space to do it. Um, or have activity just to have it. You want to have right. it be really, really well thought out and have Correct. it be something related and, and hopefully original. Right. You, know, you just don't want to be poaching from others in the field and you know, right. laying claim to it. Yeah, with social media, you have what I call kind of peer professional networks. Those are the organizations with which you collaborate and then there's the ones in which you compete. The ones with which you collaborate, if you are a house painter and your local paint shop has a great Facebook stream and they might, you should share content from theirs to yours and always tag them in. You use an at sign to get a live link in your body content of your post to say, you know, big thanks to our friends over at such and such paint shop with a great Facebook page and this article about what colors are trending for 2021. Take a look. Uh, that's excellent. And that kind of sharing is spectacular. I will add, um, you can use hashtags to help define search. So if you're publishing content on Facebook and it's about uh, color trends for 2021 and you're a house painter, use a couple hashtags that'll help people find you in search, which could be hashtag color trends 2021 or color trends for houses 2021. And those are things that people are actually searching for either in Google or actually in the Facebook search box. And that will help float your content higher to people who've never seen it before. All right, going to a couple of comments and then scroll back. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, where did we leave off here? So one individual, um, she says, I am in travel. It came to a screeching halt in March. Mm -hmm. I reduced expenses. I'm working on rebranding now. Next will be social media and the website. I am not selling travel now. Too many cancellations. Yes, right. I know that that industry hit very, very hard. Very hard, right. Uh, and it will come back. Um, this, is, this is one of the industries where, uh, unfortunately, patience is so important. However, you could probably do, spend some time right now in social educating people about all the places they want to go and let them dream a little bit with you about what's going to be like when we finally can go and, and where will you go. And, here, you know, literally teaching people about different countries and different states and different national parks or whatever types of travel you're normally selling and letting people know you're still here. And we understand that people aren't traveling much right now, but that will not always be the case. And so I think there is an element for some people of just dreaming um, of when this is done and when we can move on from this experience and life eases up, what will that be like? And you can facilitate that conversation while you're waiting for things to come back online. And I do know it's been heartbreaking. I know it. That's one of the industries. Another patron commented, um, this is really nice to have for franchise businesses. We help them find their brand standards. Mm -hmm. Very often small businesses are not prepared for that. What do you think about the quote, what's happening in end quote websites? We have been doing these and referring our customers. Can you talk more about how hashtags work across search domains? Sure. Hashtags are important and often misused. People think hashtags are a place to editorialize. So for example, if for on my Good Egg Concepts Facebook page, I put up something about something going on in Chicago, I would not put a hashtag after that bit of content that says, hashtag, isn't it a great day in Chicago? Because nobody's really searching for that. But if the piece of content is about uh, five things you can still do during the holidays in Chicago that are COVID safe, um, my, my hashtags after that could be COVID friendly activities or uh, hashtag Chicago outdoor activities or whatever it is. You want to use the keywords that someone might use to search and thereby find that piece of information. So smaller businesses can really benefit from this because the hashtags 
essentially tell the social platform uh, what are the key words in this content. And if the key words are being searched by some random person anywhere, your bit of content will show up much higher in the search results than that of um, a piece of content that doesn't have hashtags or that's uh, not well focused. So it's just an opportunity. Hashtags are, I think librarians could probably speak more about how when you search for things, the more specific you are, the more likely you are to find what you're looking for. Question um, comes up, if you put it in Facebook, will it show up in Google? If you, um, can you clarify um, to our patron, if you put what, if you, oh, a hashtag in Facebook, if you put a hashtag in Facebook, will it show uh, up? That's a sort of tricky thing to answer because it's going to depend on your security settings. If your page is wide open, anyone can be on it, it can show up in Google search. For example, um, we'll have to use kind of a bold example. Let's say uh, you're a, a baker and you are being interviewed by the NBC Nightly News uh, about baking during the holidays or something. And uh, Savannah Guthrie or someone famous is interviewing you. You can then take that clip of whatever the interview is and publish it to your Facebook page. And assuming that it's open and visible to the public with hashtags, you'll hashtag NBC Nightly News, hashtag baking during the holidays, hashtag Savannah Guthrie, hashtag whatever else uh, is germane to what you just interviewed about. Then in time on Facebook, when someone searches for bakers near me or baking during the holidays or baking and NBC News, because people search for things like that, uh, your bit of content may show up in the Google search and kind of cross from the platform Facebook to the Google search returns. Uh, but even if it doesn't, people also search within uh, social platforms. They search within Twitter, they search within Facebook uh, and so forth. And it will turn up very high in search if you do those things. And I would also encourage you when you do that, when you write a little piece of content, let's say you're sharing that baking clip uh, and you wanna say something like, we got up extra early this morning to be interviewed by Savannah Guthrie for the NBC News, blah, 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 whatever you say. When you do that, if NBC News has a Facebook page, which of course it does, and the Today Show does, and it may drill down specifically to the anchors, put an at sign before the proper name of whatever the page is that you want to link to. So if there is a Today Show baking page, you go check on Facebook, what is their exact handle? Is it at Today Show Baking or whatever they use? And you make sure that that's in the content because it creates a live link between your piece of content and that page. And some percent of the audience that's interested in the Today Show Baking page is gonna be interested to see your interview. And you pull audience eyes toward your content when you do that, when you include live links in the content and hashtags after the content that are search terms. I hope that answers the question. Couple more questions coming in, Rebecca, if we, uh, sure. and I think we, we have a, a few more moments. Um, sure. One attendee says, I'm a vocal coach and I have a Facebook business page where I share pictures of vocal coaching content and tips. I created a flyer for an offer and put it on a few different pages. I got a couple customers from the flyer. Challenges having a student discontinue because of personal reasons. Any tips to keep current customers and attract new and also um, attract new customers the best way with my type of business? Uh huh. That's a great question. So that's fantastic that you even got some customers. That's a good start. So if they're game to celebrate what they're working on, if anyone is game to be recorded singing or practicing whatever they're vocalizing, could we do a clip of that and maybe even use it diagnostically to show people look where we began and look where we are now, or look at um, how this person, uh, you know, explain what it is. Is it coloratura? Are we practicing the American songbook? Are we practicing Schubert leader? What are we practicing? And teach your audience what people are learning with you. I think people would be fascinated by that. And a lot of people need to screw up their courage to take lessons like you offer. And if they see everyday people doing it, it may encourage them and inspire them. And you can help create that inspiration by telling the story that this was a person who was terribly phobic and decided in 2020 to give it a go and try to kind of find their voice, so to speak. Um, that would be very cool. Another thing that you can do is boost your content. And that is Facebook language for advertising. 
monetize. And if you have a Facebook business page, you can boost a few different ways. When you have a piece of content or just your page, you can also boost your page. Um, Facebook will drop it into the reading streams of whoever you designate. So for example, you can boost to people who are friends of people who like your page. So if you're a vocal coach and you have a hundred people who like your page, you really have a much bigger network because the friends of people who like your page, um, each person probably has 250, 500 friends. So a hundred times 250, hundred times 500, that's who you're boosting to if you do friends of people who like your page. So if 100 people like your vocal page, you can bet your bippy that some of the people they're friends with on Facebook also like vocal pages and would like to know more about your practice and maybe have talked to their friend about the lessons they're taking and wish they could do it too. And people always seem surprised. I don't understand how Facebook knows that I was looking for a vocal coach. Well, one of the ways is through search. And the other way is if we boost things through the people who already like it, you're gonna be invited to it too. Second way you can do it is with what we call custom audiences. And on Facebook, when you go to boost content or your page, you can choose what we call a custom audience, which you define any way you want by plugging in, and it's very easy to do, the demographic characteristics of the ideal audience. And custom audiences, you can make as many as you want and save them as what they are. For example, if you live in Rogers Park, you can have the Rogers Park neighbors. If you want to reach people in Winnetka, you can have your Winnetka list and use zip codes and um, school names or um, uh, different types of landmarks or houses of worship to get people who have the demographic interests that you're trying to reach. So that's an excellent way to boost to. So like if you're trying to grow or amplify your offering to a broader audience, take a chance on boosting for sure uh, and boost toward um, demographic characteristics you want to reach. And I think Facebook also does one um, through targeting. So when a, when a person is searching on Google for a vocal coach, they don't realize that all of those searches are kind of stuck to the front end of their browser. And then they come over to Facebook to just see what's going on. And suddenly every ad on Facebook is for vocal coaches uh, or plumbers or running shoes, because that's what they were searching on platform X for something. And you come to Facebook and then Facebook does the matching and you as the business owner tell Facebook, I want to find people that have the following characteristics or who are interested in the following products. And then it does the matching for you. So that will help you reach people you've never met before and let them know that you as a vocal coach are available and ready to offer lessons. Um, and it's very good for business. Those are some very, very solid suggestions. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and I think our last question here is, um, and this might actually, um, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to answer the question. It is about, about Twitter. What's the best way to start out on Twitter? Um, this individual does not do that now, but mm -hmm. um, I also think that's possibly a, a topic for a future class we can invite you back to another time. But if sure. we wanna give some starting steps. Well, I mean, the first step with Twitter is to create a profile. Uh, and, and just, I would say, be what we call in the business, a lurker, like create a profile and start to follow or like um, entities that you care about. So for example, if you care about the Joffrey Ballet, like them on Twitter, if you care about the New York Stock Ex Exchange, like it on Twitter, if you're interested in McDonald's, like it on Twitter, uh, and start to see how the information flows on the platform. I think that's your number one first step is creating your own profile and then following things that you find interesting. Because what you're basically doing is creating your own news stream, which is a very interesting thing to do. You can do it on any social platform, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. And that's a good way to begin. Like, Don't try to publish anything. Don't try to share anything. Don't try to even engage in any conversations. Just watch and read and see what you like and see what you don't like. I will say with Twitter, um, it's a more national slash international facing platform in my opinion. You can certainly use it for local marketing, but think about people's behavior. Most people um, in the casual consumer world don't hang out on Twitter reading it. They, they might look at it or they may care about some issues or organizations or famous people and they get involved that way. Uh, Facebook is more like, um, everyone's good reading stream. It's like the local news completely, however you tune it to whatever wavelength you tune it. And with Twitter, um, I think then you can take a chance when you're ready, 
try tweeting something that you want to share. Is it a product offering? Is it an achievement? Did you just win an award for the most beautiful floral arrangement or for a vocal competition that just took place online? Uh, when you start to share that, you're going to pick up followers and the followers and starts to get kind of sticky and stuff starts to move pretty fast. And it could be very good for you. I do think you have to be prepared in some of these instances that it can move so fast, you have to really watch the comments and make sure things are trending in the direction that you want them to go in. Because um, it's it can, things can accelerate fast. So I would always say, begin with things that are very neutral or very positive and go from there. All right, well, Rebecca, I wanna thank you again so very much for coming and addressing all of our questions. We're getting a lot of uh, thank yous in our chat oh, to you thank for you. all of your specific uh, guidance. And again, I hope to welcome you back into, um, into the building in 2021. I'm confident that that will happen. And in the meantime, yep. thank you for all attendees for making time uh, for the, tonight's program. And if there are any questions that the library can help you with, my email address is in the chat. Please give us a call. We are here to assist um, to the best that we can. And we're just very grateful to all of our patrons. And again, mm -hmm. Rebecca, take good care. Thank you. And I hope everyone takes care and has good holiday season. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone.